Born in the cooling ashes of the Cold War, Mir was now in place and awaiting a new crew. An exciting new era of scientific discovery was about to dawn. After the morning's first calm pass, it was time for breakfast. Hot water was added to dehydrated bags of soup. Tins of meat stew were heated in a portable oven. Adding to the claustrophobic feeling of such small quarters was the inescapable hum of thousands of tons of equipment crowding in from every angle. An insidious noise that had to be monitored to keep it within bearable ranges. Although the days were long and the rest was needed, sleep aboard Mir was not a serene sleep. I called this son, son of the I would name this sleep mother's sleep. She wakes up if her baby makes just a little chirp, no matter how tired she is. American astronaut Jerry Lininger performed the first joint U.S.-Soviet spacewalk in 1997. You feel like you're falling uh, the entire time. It feels like the space station itself is falling. Uh, to the point of free-falling parachuting, it gives you that sensation pretty much the whole time. On the end of the stroller arm, it was very flimsy feeling. It felt like, uh, like you were a fish on the end of a very flimsy fishing pole getting whipped back and forth. <laughs> and when it gets dark, that instant you are basically blind and falling. Even in the dark it feels like you're falling for some reason. Working under these conditions, Mir cosmonauts perform numerous extravehicular activities, or EVAs, to build and maintain the ever-expanding station. But many of the EVAs proved difficult. Throughout the period that Mir was operational, its residents overcame numerous challenges thrown at them by their unique environment. Whether man is truly suited to life in space remained an unanswered question. To explore this phenomenon, the 14th International Mission arrived in August 1988. Their flights to Mir would last from 120 to 180 days and no more. These shorter stays meant that the cosmonauts would be more efficient in their work and research while on the station and return to Earth with less physiological damage. Even though it seemed to float as an isolated and pristine outpost for science, Mir was always tethered to the world turning beneath and the changes which were rapidly unfolding below. This was never more obvious than during the collapse of the Soviet Empire in 1991. As their country on Earth crumbled, cosmonauts were left to ponder their fate in space. A deal was forged between Washington and Moscow in 1994. The U.S. would pay some $400 million in rent, and the Russians agreed to extend the station's life to include the training of astronauts. The idea of working together had great scientific and diplomatic potential, but an aging spacecraft would test the mettle of everyone involved. 
When the space shuttle Atlantis completed the historic first docking of an American shuttle with the Russian space station, the shuttle delivered Mir's new replacement crew and brought Thagard back to Earth. The second NASA mission to Mir was a huge public relations coup. Shannon Lucid's ability to integrate with the Russian crew touched a popular chord. There seemed to be hope for Russian-American. Ten years past its expected lifespan, the old soldier's tour of duty had finally come to an end. During its lifetime, Mir made the void at the edge of our universe an inhabitable domain. A trailblazer in the exploration of space, it launched a new era of discovery and left behind a bounty of scientific riches. Wherever we voyage next, to new colonies in space, to distant planets or beyond, we must salute those who forged the path. Thousands of engineers, a hundred bold travelers, and one tough old space station called Mir.